Well, good morning. My name is Richie Ford, and I'm the director of the children's ministries here at Hope. Well, listen, as usual, uh, inside your worship folder, you will find uh, some blue notes to help you follow along here this morning. Well, this Memorial Day weekend, I'm reminded of something that I saw uh, multiple times uh, during my time in the Army. As a soldier in the 101st Airborne Division, I was deployed to Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan for 14 months. And if you don't know, Bagram uh, is the main airfield in the theater of Afghanistan, which means that any time a service member lost their life while serving in the theater of Afghanistan, their body had to come back through Bagram before returning home here to the States. And so each time this happened, uh, the body of the fallen service member in a casket with an American flag draped over it was driven down that main road that went through Bagram. And as a way of honoring those fallen service, the fallen service member or sometimes service members, all of us there at Bagram would go out and silently stand on either side of that main road as the body passed as a way of giving our respect to those who are never going to make it home. And so this morning, I think it would be fitting to pray to pray for those of you uh, who have a friend or family member uh, who has given their life to service of this country, or to pray for those of you that have a friend or family member that has served uh, but has since passed on, because we want to remember them as well. And so if that applies to you, if either one of those apply to you, I would just ask, would you be willing to stand uh, this morning so that we can pray uh, for you? And uh, church family, as you look around, um, yep, don't be, yep. And church family, as you look around and see those standing, would you just be willing to extend a hand as we pray? And even if you're close to someone who's standing, would you even be willing to just go over and lay a hand on them uh, as we pray? Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we want to thank you for this time. We want to thank you for this space. Jesus, we want uh, to recognize a, a thankful heart for those that have gone before us and have sacrificed not just some, but they sacrificed everything. They gave it all, uh, and we are recipients of that sacrifice. So we thank you. And Jesus, those that are standing here uh, among us, we know, Father, that uh, in some space in their heart, there's still a hole because this friend or the family member that they're thinking of in this moment, in this space, is no longer with them. And so, Jesus, in a very real way, we pray the power of your Holy Spirit to comfort their hearts, wash over them, Father, and also bring to their memory, Jesus, the great example of this friend or family member uh, left them in the uh, idea and attitude of service and sacrifice. We thank you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you. Well, as I was thinking about uh, Memorial Day, uh, I found myself asking the question, okay, why do we remember those service members who have given their lives to service of this country? Well, the answer came pretty quick. Those service members gave of themselves in such a way that was greater than themselves. They sacrificed, right? And if that's not worth remembering, I don't know what is. And as many of you know here this morning, this, this life, this attitude of sacrifice should be in each and every one of us if we are claiming to be a follower of Jesus. Unfortunately, this life gets busy this life gets noisy, and it's so easy for us to get caught up in ourselves, right? And listen, by getting caught up in ourselves, I, I, I don't just mean, hey, look at me, I'm so amazing, okay? Yes, we all deal with that. You know that's pride. And yes, a lot of times that is what keeps us from knowing and experiencing Jesus as he desires for us. But I think it's also uh, easy to get caught up in ourselves in such a way where we're just overwhelmed with life. I know I get there. Often, just ask my wife, okay? I was there last weekend. 
when the lawnmower wouldn't start. You understand, I, I was spending hours of time that in my mind, obviously, I had, but I felt like I didn't have. And I'm, I'm changing the oil multiple times, trying different types of oil, and I'm, I'm dumping out the gas because I'm trying to troubleshoot. The gas is a few months old. I, I guess I got to go get fresh gas. I'm changing the spark plug. I'm changing the filter. The whole time, doubting myself. You understand, because I'm about as good with mechanical things as a kindergartner would be with algebra, Okay. And that's no offense to any kindergartners, all right? And so I have a, a short clip uh, for us that I think uh, paints this picture well, this picture of just kind of getting in that rut of we're, we're caught up in ourselves, we're overwhelmed with life. It's a clip from a favorite show of my wife and I, uh, The Wonder Years. So let's watch that. Dad, have you ever thought about your life? Huh? Oh, well, it's for school. I mean, if you had to write about it, what would you say? Okay, time for a meaningful father-son exchange here. A thoughtful summing up. I get up at five in the morning. I fight traffic. I bust my hump all day. I fight traffic again. And I come home. Then I pay my taxes. The end. <clears throat> In a way, it kind of made you feel like you knew the guy. Well, it's easy to get caught in that place, isn't it? That place where we feel like the only purpose to our lives is to work so we can pay our bills, pay our taxes, fix the things that break, like the lawnmower, and then we die. So to help us kind of step back from that attitude that we all get caught in this Memorial Day weekend, we're going to ask the question, hey, how do you want to be remembered? And as you hear that question, and it rolls around in your mind, I would imagine there's many of us here that would say, well, okay, if you're asking me, I, I mean, I guess I would like to be remembered as someone who was willing to give to things that were greater than myself. I, I mean, I'd like to be remembered like those that we remember at Memorial Day. I don't want to just be remembered as someone who was just so caught up in myself and overwhelmed with life. Okay, but how do we do that? I think we have to look to some people that are a little bit further along in this life than we are. I think we need some examples to look to. Fortunately, we have many of those examples here among us. We're just not always good at seeing them. Forgive me, I have to go a little bit of a tangent, but I'll be right back, okay? You see, church, one of the many things that I have been honored to learn from Menominee culture is how they see their older ones. You see, in Menominee culture, an older person is referred to as an elder, someone who deserves the utmost respect, someone who has served food first, someone who's given a seat of honor, someone who, when they speak, others don't just listen, they learn. Unfortunately, in American culture, how we describe our older ones, we take that word elder, we add two letters to the end of it to get elderly. And what an unfortunate difference those two letters make. For the, the word elderly implies a whole different set of expectations, doesn't it? I mean, just think about it. Someone who drives too slow. Someone who's a little bit out of date. Someone who's a little bit out of touch. Someone who, come on, let's just be honest, doesn't really have that much to offer Sadly, I have to be honest with you, I've been guilty of this attitude myself, and I think sometimes we're guilty of this attitude here at Hope. Always courting the young families, but not making sure our older ones have a place of honor and respect. Tangent done. So, this morning we're going to have a few guests uh, here, right from here uh, within uh, these four walls. Three guests who have a combined average age of 81. It was okay. I asked him if I could share that, all right? Three guests that I want to challenge us all that when they speak, we deserve to not only listen but to learn. Three guests that demand the utmost of our respect. Three guests I want to challenge us all, including myself. Let's not see them as elderly. Let's see them as elders. And so please give a warm welcome to Howard Richter, Phoebe Richter, and Connie Summer. Let's welcome them.
Well, thanks for uh, being willing to be here uh, with us. We really appreciate it. And as you all know, uh, we just started asking the question, hey, how can we be remembered as someone who is willing to give to things that were greater uh, than ourselves? And so knowing the three of you and, and the followers of Jesus that you are, I trust you will have some great insight for us around this question. So the first thing that we're going to do is kind of just jump into, hey, how do we live an honorable life? And so, Howard, I want to start with you. Um, I understand you had a construction business, correct? That's correct. Okay, so what would you say your motto was for running that business? Well, let me start with a, with a story. There was a, a man that was a builder, and uh, he was uh, approaching retirement age, so he went to his, his employer and told him that he wanted to, wanted to hang it up and, and, um, and quit, quit building. His employer said, well, he said, I'd like you to build uh, just one, one more house. So they agreed to do that, and, and he built the house, but his, his heart wasn't really in it. He, um, he's <clears throat> the workmanship was not, uh, not, not his best, and they started cutting corners and making concessions for different things, and it just, just was not done right. Anyway, he finished it. He went to... Uh, went to his employer to get, to get paid and to, to say his farewells, and uh, which were done, and he turned around to, to leave, and his employer says, uh, wait, just one, one more thing. And he um, took a set of keys out of his pocket and gave to him, and he says, uh, these are the keys to the house you just built. Uh, it's, it's your house. <laughs> anyway... <clears throat> I didn't want, did not want to be a builder like that, and uh, so it uh, became a a, t a time of prayer. And actually, we prayed for years for what uh, what we should we do and how we should do it because I wanted to do the best job I could do uh, that uh, for the people that I worked for because where I was working at the time it was kind of heading in that in that wrong direction, and I wanted to do better. And because I believe the Lord wants us to do the best we can, and that was, that was, my, that was my goal and my desire. And um, <clears throat> God blessed that. It did come, come a time when, when uh, God opened the door for the people. There was, there was a, lot, a lot of work to, to be done. People wanted me to do it. And uh, so we continued praying about it, and, and we made that move. And uh, because people wanted quality work, they, they shared it with, with others. And uh, for the 25 years plus following that, uh, we were never out of work. We always had, had work to do. God gave us good people that appreciated it, and, and, uh, and it's... And it's, it's a joy to give when, you, when people appreciate it and you know you're doing your best. Mm. Oh, thank you, Howard. I appreciate it. And so I, I think what we can take away uh, from this is that no matter what you do, treat other people the way you want to be treated, right? I mean, let's remember Jesus' words, Luke 6.31. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. I know you're like, yep. I hear that, Richie. I got it. But we obviously don't get it. I mean, just look at what's going on all around us. I mean, can you imagine for a minute, like, if we grabbed a hold of this attitude, this is how we can build an honorable life. This is how we can give to things that are greater than ourselves, following Howard's example. I mean, just think how things would look. If we took this attitude to our schools, our workplaces, our homes, people would feel cared for. Unfortunately, a lot of times we, what we do, right, is we take this nice, neat command of Jesus that some of us have learned since we were a child, and we, we take the expectation placed on us. We ball it up and we push it to the side, turning this command really into a sense of entitlement. It's as if we twist Jesus' words so that they read, hey, check this out. Other people ought to do to me 
as I want them to do to me. And when they don't, I'm going to let them know about it. Well, that attitude, as you all know, cannot and will not lend to us giving to things that are greater than ourselves. Well, next I want our guests to speak to hard times uh, because I know that you don't get to be where they are without going through hard times. And so, Phoebe, I want to uh, come to you with this question. I understand you, your brother, and sister were age five and under when your father passed away, correct? Yes, they, we were. So can you share with us a little bit about how you got through that situation? Sure. Yes, Daddy drowned and left Mom with us three little ones. And that not only that, she lost her mother just a few months prior to that, which left my grandfather alone. And of course, she was alone with the three of us. And he was willing to let us come into his home and care for him along with three little kids running around. And, you know, I look at the age I am now, and I'm just thinking, three little kids running around my house? No thanks. But he did, and I'm just so thankful. He was such an inspiration to us. He was there and just helped us in so many ways. And I know even though Mom ministered to him, it was vice versa, too. And he was more like the father figure that we didn't have. And so this was, was the way it uh, went. But some of my fondest memories are of my mom and us sitting on the sofa. She would get out the Edgar Myers Bible story book, read to us a Bible story every day. It was just a, a ritual that we did. And not only that, but we would get down on our knees and we would pray. And she taught us all of this from the very little on up, that this is what was necessary to do. And she stood on the scripture in Psalms 146, 9. The Lord will take care of the fatherless and the widow. He did. He did. But you know what we learned? And mom would just say so many times, problems would come up. She'd just say, kids, pray. And we learned at a very young age, God answers prayer. He is there. Not always the way we wanted, but he answered prayer for us. He saw us through many things that... Otherwise, we would not have gotten through. So I'm just so thankful. God was there in the time of our need. Hmm. So Phoebe, would you say that at an early age, you learned how to kind of set aside worry and just pray? Yes. And so I think what we can take away from here is that no matter the hard time, no matter the situation, prayer, not worry, has the ability to carry us through. Why? Just think about Philippians 4, 7. That when we set aside worry and pray, when we thank God for all that he's done and we tell him all that we need, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Wow. What a promise, right? A promise many of us here would nod our heads to and say, yes, absolutely, amen. But, I mean, unfortunately, if we're honest, that's not always enough to motivate us, is it? Because I know firsthand that one of Pastor John's biggest discouragements here is just a lack of prayer. And in my short four years here, I've been hit with that discouragement myself. It's hard to rally people to pray. Look, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip out there on anyone, but this is reality. We, we have to speak the truth. And so if that's the reality, and, and we know the promises that God gives us in his word around prayer, that should push us all the more to prayer because it's powerful. And Connie, I know you have a strong belief in the, pro the power of prayer. Is that correct? Yes, I do. So can you share with us a, a, a story maybe from your life uh, that showcases the power of prayer? Well, for years and years, I had cried and I prayed and pleaded with God to change uh, my son's, uh, Greg, uh, from his way of life that he was having. And he had started making some bad choices about his early teen years and then on into high school years. 
he had even been court ordered to go to uh, the Rawhide Boys Ranch in New London. With, he spent his junior year there. And we had raised our, our children, on, including Greg, to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to understand um, the gift of salvation that God has given to, uh, to his people. So he, Greg had known about Jesus. So one time I, when he was at Rawhide, we visited uh, on a Sunday. And while we were there, I just talked to Greg about his faith and wanted to know exactly you know, what, what he believed. And he said, yeah, Mom, I, I know about Jesus, and I know he suffered and died for me, and yeah, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'll never have faith like you and Dad or John Gillespie. And John Gillespie was the founder of the Rawhide Boys Ranch. So I continued to pray for Greg for years. Uh, another thing that I was thinking about was if God would just change him, if God would just turn him into a man after God. And I just surrendered him to God and said, whatever it takes, Lord, just do it for Greg, just to change him and his way of life and his choices in the time. It's, and I even think about how God had changed Saul into a Paul. And I prayed for that. Even if God was, Greg wasn't willing to change, just change him, God, and let him, let him want to follow you and become what you want him to be. So I continued to pray for Greg for more years and more years. And one time when I was uh, doing a ministry trip down in Mexico for an orphanage there, I received an email from Greg. And he said and in the email, when are you coming home, Mom? I told him in the middle of March. And he said in his email, I want, I'm going to have my baptism, my like believer's baptism, and I, just to let people know that I am a follower of Christ now, and I want you to be there. So Greg was now 52 years old, and I had prayed for him all those years from little on up until this age. So that was such an exciting time for me. Um, Greg wanted to become a man of God. He wanted to be on fire for God instead of being lukewarm. Because uh, he knows God, God doesn't like us to be lukewarm. In fact, he'll spit us out. Mm. So Greg has been come on fire for, for the Lord, and he praises God and gives him thanks and glorifies him among his friends wherever he is, on Facebook and at his church. He serves it in this mission uh, church plant in Merrill. So he has turned into the, the what I had prayed that he would do, become a man of God. Mm. That's awesome. Thanks, Connie. And I think what we can take away here is that uh, we all are called to pray, right? We can't leave the praying to be done here by the prayer warriors like the three elders that you see sitting up here. No, we got to hear the call of First Thess Thessalonians 5.17, never stop praying. Listen, you all know the hard times have come. They will continue to come. But faith in God and disciplined prayer has the ability to carry us much more than I think we allow. It also has the ability to help us give of ourselves in such a way where we're giving in a way that's greater than ourselves. And well, which I just wanted to say, which I forgot. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> don't ever give up on praying for your loved ones, your children, your family. Yes. Don't ever stop. God is faithful. He will answer our prayers. Sometimes it's a long time. Yes. But he does. He is so faithful. No, Don't stop praying. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Romans 12, 1 speaks of running uh, this race that God has set before us, this race of life with endurance. And so you all know, lifelong race, there's going to be many hills, many <laughs> challenges. And so the question that I have for the three of you is, how have you run some of these hills, these challenges in your life uh, with endurance. And so I want to start with Howard and Phoebe. As I understand, you will have been married uh, 60 years this October. Is that correct? That's right. Wow. That is, yeah, go ahead. We can, that is a real accomplishment. Wow. But I also know the both of you have had your share of health issues through the years. And so my question to you is, how have you run this hill, this challenge of health issues uh, with endurance? throughout uh, the course of your marriage? 
we couldn't have done it without the Lord. That's all there is to it. I mean, Howard had uh, bypass surgery about 17 years ago, and God was so faithful, so good. I said, he just saw us through. He gave us the peace that we needed. We just thank the Lord for all the care and love that he received. And he's still doing good. He's still here by me. And so I'm just so thankful for that. And then about six years ago, I had diagnosis of my heart. It was a little different than Howard's. I was more in atrial fibrillation, but it was causing a lot of problems. I had to go to Mayo and have surgery for that and just got through that about a year later, got the diagnosis that we all dread. That was I had cancer. And of course, then going through the treatment, the chemo, the surgery, the radiation, if it wouldn't have been for God, for my husband, and for people here in the church, I couldn't have gotten through it, but God is so faithful. He is just there. He's there for us no matter what. He cares for us. He loves us. And as we have shared together and loved on each other, God has been there for us. And I'm just so thankful for all he has done, for all he's doing in our lives. We never know what's ahead. But God does, and he's there ahead of us, and I just thank him for that. Hmm. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing. And Connie, I understand you have been a widow now for the last 16 years. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is. So, Connie, my question to you is how have you run that hill, that challenge of, of being a widow? How have you run that with endurance in the race God has set before you? Well, my husband and I had gone on a mission trip to Haiti, and ministered for just a, on a short-term ministry uh, trip. And uh, when we got home, maybe eight years later, uh, we had a missionary come to our church in Appleton, our small church plant there, and he showed us slide after slide of children on the dump heap of Manila. They were dirty and had scabs on their face and sores but their eyes were so empty and so tearful. I, I just couldn't stay and watch so many of those slides. I just had to get up and leave the room. My heart was just broken for those children. So God uh, began to call me to come and do mission trips, uh, take care of the orphanages, orphans in the orphanages in different third world countries. But it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right timing for it, but God was urging me on it, so I was thinking about it. But as John was telling us about in Ecclesiastes, it's 3-1, for everything there is a season. There's a season for anything that matters under the sun. And this was not my time then to go on a mission trip because my husband wasn't interested uh, in doing mission work abroad, so he thought he would just do the evangelism around the area in Appleton, so that's what he did. Oh, maybe 10 years passed by after I had seen these slides of the children. And my husband was suddenly and unexpectedly called home to be with Jesus. And I always say this, too. I didn't lose him. I knew where he went. So people say, I'm sorry you lost your husband. It's like, I know where he is. I know he, mm. he just went there ahead of me. Mm. And so... Um, when God was calling me again and again to go to the third world countries of developing countries and love on little children, uh, when my daughter from here and her, and her husband, Tom, decided that, yeah, I could come and live with them, so I got rid of all my household possessions, all, almost all of them, and came and lived with uh, them here in on China. So then I was freed up to when God again would call me and call me and say this is what you know he wanted me to do that I did go on mission trips. I was 71 years old when I did my first mission trip and God blessed me so much with the opportunity to serve him by just loving loving on his children and giving them attention which they never they never got. They might have been fed or their mom held them while she nursed them, but no one ever took time just to spend time with them, and they were so needy for that. So I was blessed in great ways to know the people in these countries 
and to be able to serve God by serving uh, in the orphanages. So I was blessed so much with that opportunity. Oh, thanks for sharing. And I think what we can take away here is that no matter the hill, no matter the challenge uh, in our life, if we want to run with endurance, this race that God has set before us, we must serve each other. We have to hear the words of Jesus in Mark 10, 43. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Now, I know that sounds great, but honestly, how does that look, right? How does that look in my marriage? How does that look in your marriage? How does that look if you're a single parent? How does that look in your singleness? How does that look if you're a middle school, high school, college-age student? I don't know. But here's what I do know. If we are willing to get down on our knees and to pray, Jesus, will you please show me how I can be a better servant? He will answer you. But before you pray that prayer, you have to ask yourself, do I really want to be told? Do I really want to listen? Because it's only when we listen that we can give of ourselves in such a way that's greater than ourselves. Well, our three guests here have shared with us some great wisdom around the question we're pressing into, but if we were kind of step back and hone in on a few basic thoughts, food for thought, as it were, uh, as we uh, press into this question about how we can uh, give of ourselves in a way that's greater than ourselves, what would each of us, what would each of you leave uh, with us? So Howard, can I start with you? I would say we were fortunate to... Uh grew up in families that had Bible-based values, the both of us, and both of us had accepted the Lord as our Savior pr prior to our marriage. And we, uh, we took, that, took that into our marriage, and right from the very beginning, we had read uh, a portion of Scripture and prayed together uh, before we went to bed. And that has been our practice. Um, through the years, and is and it's still today, we continue continue that on. God has God has been good. Another thing is um, learning to apologize, mm. learning to forgive, and just to uh, forgiveness is so powerful. It is so powerful. It frees us. It takes the burden. It just, um, it, it purifies us, really. Hmm. Forgiveness. I don't think we, we stress forgiveness enough, but it, it's so value, valuable in, in relationships, and God has blessed us with that. Hmm. Thank you, Howard. And Phoebe, I know you and Howard have done a lot of serving uh, together. Can you speak to that? Yes, we have. We have served each other all these years, but we've served the Lord. And in serving the Lord, there's a lot of outreach in the church that needs people working. And this is what we have tried to do over the years, working with the young people, working um, with making meals, doing various things. Howard, of course, has, with his building, has always and still does enjoy building and to just repair things or whatever needs to be done. And it's just a joy to do it. And even yet, though our ministries have changed to a certain point because of the age, we can't quite get down with those little ones anymore, but we can do things. And we just want to be active in the church and with each other and just serving the Lord, no matter what he calls us to do, just to be willing. And I'm just so thankful for a loving husband and for my mom who helped me to set that foundation and to serve the Lord with all my heart. And I just pray that we continue to do so until he calls us home. Thank you, Phoebe. And Connie, I know uh, another passion of yours is spiritual gifts. So you, can you take a moment to speak to that? Okay, yes. Like Howard and Phoebe, um, having, liking to serve, God has also given me that spiritual gift of service. When we ask God to forgive our sins, take our sins away, and we have received the gift of his grace for eternal life, and we become followers of Christ, God gives us gifts, and we're called spiritual gifts. And 
when we receive those, God doesn't want us just to hold out our hand, take them, set them down somewhere, and never use them. Those gifts aren't given us to, for ourselves, but they're given us so that we, can, that we can encourage other people, serve other people, and glorify God uh, because of his gifts. Okay. So everyone that has trusted Christ does have a gift or more gifts. God is so generous. He often gives us more than just one spiritual gift, but he does want us to use them mm -hmm. So for his glory. So I just urge everyone to find out your spiritual gift. Use it. God has a plan for it. That's why he's given us uh, spiritual gifts to use. So, yeah, I have a passion for people to find out and use their spiritual gifts. Thank you, Connie. Well, if we could, let's give uh, our three elders here a round of applause for their wisdom this morning. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And so I hope you all were encouraged this morning, uh, even spurred on, in hearing uh, from three people uh, who have given their lives over to serving Jesus and to serving those around them. And if some of the things that you heard this morning maybe resonated with you, kind of stirred your heart, but you would say, well, hey, I'm not a follower of, of Jesus. I, don't, I, I haven't felt the power of his Holy Spirit forgiving me of my sins or forgiving me of my sins and pulling me, drawing me back to him. If that's you, I just want to encourage you. Don't leave here this morning without making a decision to begin a relationship with Jesus today. It's one of the best decisions that you can ever make, but it's a decision you won't have forever to make, and it will impact all of eternity for you. We have to hear the words of Joshua 24, 15, choose today whom you will serve. Secondly, to those of you who are followers of Jesus, awesome, I want to encourage you, be active in your faith with him. Seek to know him more and more. Listen, we are not going to be 80 years old and turn out like the elders we heard from this morning if we do not use the time God has given us now to seek him out and to know him better. That's the call of Isaiah 55, 6, right? Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. And lastly, I want to encourage all of us, just as Connie uh, so wonderfully did, know your spiritual gifts. Why? We all have them. Romans 12, 6 tells us God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And so I know this may be new to some of you, and you might be saying, well, how am I a spiritual gift? What am I? I have no idea. That's okay. If you go to our church website, seanochurch.org slash serve, you'll find a ministry questionnaire. Click on that link. It takes you about 15 minutes, and it will give you some results to kind of guide you to where some of your spiritual gifts may be. Of course, it's not perfect, okay? Uh, but here's the deal. Once you know some of your spiritual gifts Remember, you also have to use them because James 2.20 does tell us faith without good deeds is useless. And so my hope here for all of us this Memorial Day weekend as we remember those uh, who give, have given their lives in service to this country is that a life of service and sacrifice is available to each and every one of us here. That's how we will be remembered as someone who is willing to give to things that were greater than ourselves, but it starts at the cross of Jesus Christ, to know him and love him as our savior. The question is, how do you want to be remembered? And so as I call the ushers forward this morning and as I close, I just want to encourage us all, let's stay in an attitude of worship and allow yourself this freedom, as Jared plays this last song, allow yourself the freedom to, to let that question roll around in your mind, boy, how do I want to be remembered? And any thoughts, any impressions uh, that you have uh, around all of this, please uh, feel free, write those down, and then take those thoughts with you today. Allow those thoughts to be a, a running conversation uh, between you and God. And also, if there's anyone uh, here that would like to come up afterwards and speak with Connie, Howard, uh, Phoebe, uh, they would love uh, to hear from you and, and maybe answer some questions uh, for you. Let's take a moment to pray. 
Jesus, we uh, thank you for this time. We thank you for this space. And Father God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Jesus, that sometimes uh, your word is hard to hear, but that's a good thing. Because your word tells us, Father, you discipline, you correct those whom you love. Not to make us feel bad. You want us to live life the way you intended. God, help us to hear that. Help us not to get caught up with all this noise, Jesus, that we all struggle with. Help us to press into, wow, how can we give of ourselves to some things that are greater than ourselves? Speak to all of our hearts here, Holy Spirit, and help us to hear you. And Lord Jesus, for those that need to make a decision for you today, place that on their heart. As there's someone in the prayer room this morning, there's Connie Howard, Phoebe. Help them not to leave without having a conversation around that. Speak to us now. Thank you for the chance to give. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.